Hey everybody, welcome back to Reading with Mrs. H. I am Mrs. H and we are reading Miss Bixby's Last Day by John David Anderson. If you can hear those funny noises in the background, that would be Eli, the Senegal parrot. He thinks it's amusing that I'm reading and he wants to talk with me. So. Anyway, all right, next chapter point of view is Steve. Change is the only constant. I came to find that written on Ms. Bixby's board, I came to find that written on Ms. Bixby's board one day. It was said by a Greek philosopher named Her Heraclitus over 2,500 years ago. I know, I looked it up. Of course, Heraclitus was a recluse who rubbed himself with cow manure before he died because he thought it would cure his swelling. So his wisdom is questionable. Still, I found the quote to be frustratingly true. Just when you think you've got something pinned down, it shifts on you. Take Pluto. I was devastated when I found out Pluto wasn't a planet anymore. And all because it's not gravitationally dominant in its own orbit, which is suddenly what's important. Not that I think Pluto should be a planet. I just think that people should be consistent in how they define things. You can't suddenly stop being a planet because of a bunch of scientists say so. The diorama on my headboard has nine planets. Astronomically inaccurate, I realize, but it gives me... It comforts seeing little Pluto sticking out on the end. Topher says I worry about this kind of stuff too much. He once said to me, The more things change, the more they stay the same. I told him that may be the dumbest thing I've ever heard. The problem is that you get used to things being the way they are. And then you wake up one day to find that they're rearrange, they rearrange the aisles in the grocery store so that you can no longer find the individually packaged applesauce cups which have moved from the canned fruit to next to the crackers. Or your sister, who used to let you sleep in her bed with her when you were little and your parents were arguing, suddenly starts whispering to boys on the phone and screams at you to get out of her room when you were just stopping by to see if she wants to play Scrabble. Or your teacher disappears with only a month left in the school year leaving you with a sub who doesn't even know the capital of Syria and doesn't call on you because she's afraid you'll politely point out when she's wrong. Or the empty chair at the lunch table you've been sitting at for years is suddenly not empty anymore. And instead of the two of you, like usual, there are three of you. And even though you know that nothing has changed, not really, that your best friend is still your best friend, you still feel uneasy because it could all change your whole relationship. Because, as the saying goes, no man steps in the same river twice. That's actually what Heraclitus said 2,500 years ago. The exact quote, probably just before he covered himself in cow poop. I'm sure his fellow Greeks wish he'd stepped in a river once or twice. One thing I am certain of, Bus 142 smells like a wet dog. The bus picks us up at State Street and then heads east, stopping 17 more places before it hits Woodfield Shopping Center. Those of you who know me in real life know what Woodfield Shopping Center is. I like the reference places that I know because it's a real place in real life. Uh, it has two sets of doors, one at the front and one in the middle. It holds approximately 48 people, 49 if you count the very large woman driving it. She stares out the front window as we drop our coins into her box. I actually drop mine in one by one because I like the sound they make. It reminds me of wind chimes. We head to the back and I'm a little surprised when Brand and Topher take a seat together. Now that they, not that they aren't allowed to exactly, just that typically Topher and I sit together. We take the same bus to school, bus 17, and every day he saves me a seat. He saves me a seat toward the back, and then he copies off my math homework while I eat some of the prepackaged cookies 
his mother gives him for lunch. My parents don't pack me sweets. They don't want me to be one of those fat American kids the TV is always complaining about. Unlike my Tupperwares full of fresh fruits and vegetables, everything in Topher's lunch box comes in its own foil wrapper, which is a very tidy, if environmentally unsound, way of doing things. The cookies usually come four to a pack, which makes two for each of us, though Topher usually lets me have three. Today, though, on this strange new bus that smells awful, Brand and Topher sit together, and I stand in the aisle for a moment, uncertain. Then the bus lurches forward, and I spin on my heels, toppling into the seat in, toppling into the seat in front of them, my backpack containing my portable speakers slamming against the side. The speakers are for the music, a mix that I put together especially for Ms. Bixby. The plan called exclusively for Beethoven, but I added a few extra tracks, things I think she would appreciate, and I listened to them all last night. She won't be able to hear them if the speakers get smashed, though. I managed to right myself and immediately get up on my knees and turn around so I'm facing them. The vinyl covering of the seat sticks to my fingers. I try not to touch it. You okay? Tover asks. I must look worried. You okay? Oh, sorry. I read that already. Uh, I nod. According to the U.S. Department of Transportation, bus accidents result resulting in injury have gone down steadily over the past 25 years. I looked it up. Good to know, Topher says, then huddles over the map with Brand, the two of them tracing our route with their fingers, even though I was the one who did all the research and marked all the points along the way, from the school to the mall, to downtown, to the hospital, to the park, and back again. It's Topher's map and Brand's idea, but it's my route. I wait a moment, then say, it should take us 23 minutes to reach Woodfield Shopping Center. Brand turns and says something to Topher, but I can't quite hear it because of the rumble of the bus engine and the squawk of the traffic right outside my window. Too much noise makes me fidgety. When I get anxious, I sometimes have a tendency to talk more. The first ever school bus was invented in 1827. It was drawn by horses, I say. Last night's research might have gone a little bit off topic, but schedules led to accident statistics, which led to the history of mass transit. Before I knew it, an entire hour had passed. That's really great, Topher says, finally looking up at me and putting down the map. Hey, instead of using our only working phone to memorize every page of Wikipedia, Maybe you could send a text to someone in our class and see if Mrs. Brownlee has said anything about us being absent yet. <clears throat> or if Mr. Mack ratted us out, Brand adds. I don't text anyone in our class, I tell Topher, though he already knows this. Except you. Until you dropped your phone in the toilet. I didn't mean it as a joke, but Brand laughs anyway. Topher gives me a dirty look. It was an accident, he says. Yeah, those toilets are death traps, Brand remarks, then starts to snicker again. The bus stops rather abruptly, sending me rocking backwards. The people get on. Nobody gets off. I turn back around, my back pressed up against the sticky seat now, and look out the window. I hear Topher laughing at something Brand says behind me and tell myself, it's not important. I don't need to know everything. It doesn't matter who sits where or by whom. Topher's my best friend, and nothing is ever going to change that. We met in first grade, Topher and I. He pointed to my Lego Star Wars lunchbox and asked if I had any of the actual Lego Star Wars sets. I told him I had four, all complete. All sitting on my dresser at home. The instructions carefully packed away in case I ever needed to rebuild them, like if an earthquake happened. He said he had a few of them too, but they weren't put together. As soon as he built them, he tore them apart and mixed the pieces in with other pieces. He also lost a Lego, 
Lego Boba Fett's legs when his dog ate them. I told him that was the craziest thing I ever heard. Not the dog part, which was troubling, but the mixing pieces part, which was even more troubling. I asked the obvious question. If you mix up all the pieces, how will you put the ship back together? Topher shrugged. I guess I'll build my own ship, he said. In that moment, I knew the most basic thing I needed to know about Topher Wren. It took a few weeks of building, with his Legos, obviously, as I refused to separate mine. But after that first month of school, we clicked. We spent every afternoon together, playing Pokemon and lightsaber battles, and at least a dozen games that Topher invented, but all involved us running around his backyard, saving the world from mummies, zombies, vampires, or giant robots. We acted out movies with cameras, mostly jumping straight into the fight scenes and skipping over the sappy parts. We could get into his parents' car and pretend it was a starship, laying, laying on the horn until one of his parents, whichever one was at home, opened a window and yelled at us to get out. It was all Topher's idea. It was always Topher's idea. I just followed his lead. Every day after school, we would set off on one of his adventures, making couch forts, we're digging holes in the park to bury our treasure in. Uh, a, a quarter or a packet of Smarties that we would forget to go dig back up. The best was when we pretended we were secret agents and would spy on my sister, using my iPod to record her conversations, or just hiding in her closet until she heard us breathing and screamed at us to get out. I spent more time with Topher than with my own family, I'm sure they weren't thrilled with that idea, this kid with the wild, scraggly blonde hair and even wilder blue eyes, monopolizing, <laughs> monopolizing my carefully allocated free time. But Topher was polite around my parents and earned decent enough grades, so I was allowed to keep him as a friend. Friends were important to my parents, provided I didn't have too many, and I didn't fear what interfere with the quest for accomplishment and recognition. We managed to stay in the same class as each, as each other every year. Topher says it's because we're a duo, like Batman and Robin, or Finn and Jake. Uh, I don't know who Finn and Jake are. Maybe somebody can tell me. Uh, other students, mostly boys, would sometimes make fun of us, sing the tree song, or just give us dirty looks. I would learned about the other things they said behind our backs eventually. I know Topher did too, but he never said anything to me. It didn't matter. All that matters was that we stuck together and saved the world from the giant robots after school. Topher is a constant, like Pi or Radical 2. He was there when I had to have my appendix removed, showing up at the hospital afterward with strawberry milkshakes and comic books. He was there when my father and mother both had to go out of town on separate business trips and I spent four agonizing days with Christina bossing me around, acting like my mother even more than usual. He was there when Tyler Fisk threatened to beat the ever-living li snot out of me because I snitched on him for cheating off my math test. We both ended up with bruises that day and compared them on the bus ride home. Mine was bigger by a quarter of an inch, which made Topher jealous for some reason. Constants are called that for a reason. You can take, you can take them for granted, like sunrises or breathing, or the hissing sound a can of Coke makes when you open it, like the quote your teacher puts on the board every morning, or your best friend saving your seat on the bus. Woodfield Mall. <laughs> I know where that is. Operator 57 calls out the stop in her gruff voice, and I stand. Topher and Brand shuffle behind me as we step off into the dewy grass, which thankfully isn't quite long enough to reach the cuffs of my socks. On our side of the street is the mall, a Sears and a J.C. Penny tethered to each other with strings of shops that my sister, Christina, could probably describe in detail. Uh, on the other side is another row of shops, 
punctuated by half a dozen restaurants. One of them is a McDonald's. But we aren't ready for that yet. We are going to, uh, we are going to the bakery three shops down. The first red circle on the map. That's where we will find the first item on our list. This is all part of the plan. The plan that we cooked up on the playground and then had to change when we found out that Mrs. B Ms. Bixby was going to Boston. The plan that had us meeting outside the school and calling in sick. The plan that calls for us making our first stop here to purchase the item and then boarding bus number 37 downtown. There we will pick up item number two. Though I'm still not sure how we are supposed to pull that off. It's illegal, for one, and probably expensive. Topher says he has an idea, but he won't tell me what it is, which means it's probably an especially bad one. Item number three on the list will be obtained last, because otherwise it will get soggy, which is why we don't need the McDonald's yet. After item three, we will walk the six remaining blocks to the hospital. Just like the three kings in the Christmas Carol, Topher says. We break Ms. Bixby out of the hospital, take her to the park circled on the map, the one I looked up last night, along with the bus schedule, and then... I'm really not sure what happens then. I just know I wasn't about to let Topher go without me. There's Michelle's, Bran says, pointing... I remember what he said last Monday under the monkey bars as we penned notes on his arms. Michelle's is a must-have. There can be no substitutes. Topher told him he sounded like a commercial. But he was right. Miss Bixby mentioned Michelle's by name. Come on. Topher gives me a tug when we run across the street, dodging potholes and cars. Bran leads the way. Me and Beck, as the bus rumbles off, letting off one last odiferous cloud of exhaust. Michelle's Bakery is a medium-sized stone building with tall glass windows filled with cakes. Most of them are probably plastic. Either that or cardboard pieces pressed together with thick, crusty icing, hard as limestone. My, mom, my, my father told me once that all vanilla ice cream in photographs is actually mashed potatoes because mashed potatoes don't melt. One reason why the real thing is never as pretty as the picture. The sign for Michelle's is also white with rolling green letters, all pressed close together. The blinking blue light says, catering available. Another sign advertises, open till 8 on weekends. There's a poster for a missing cat named Prin Princess Papa. I'm not fond of cats. My family doesn't own any pets, which is only odd because my sister is planning to become a vet veterinarian. I suspect she just wants to become a doctor, but doesn't want patients that can argue with her. We walk in, and a bell on the door jangles. Hello, welcome to Michelle's, says a man with an accent that catches me off guard. I look around and spy him standing behind a counter, the only other person in the bakery besides us. The man is large. Not overweight like Mr. McElroy, but large like a wrestler, thick, muscled, and bulky. He has dark bronze skin and black hair. In keeping with my expectations, he at least has a mustache. Are you Michelle, I ask? I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just curious. He doesn't look like a Michelle. Topher says that sometimes I say things that can really come off the wrong way. I'm wondering if this is one of those times. Beside me, Brand's already shaking his head. Not Michelle, the man says. I'm Eduardo. Eduardo, I repeat. It's another habit of mine, echoing people. I just want to make sure I heard it right. He looks like an Eduardo. Michelle's just the name on the sign. I'm the guy who bakes the cakes. I nod. Then I turn around. The bakery, at least, smells much better than the bus. Everything in here is white, except for Eduardo and me. There are rows of of cupcakes and glass display in front of us, each of them curly-cued with thick whips of frosting. My mouth waters looking at them. At my house, the closest we get to dessert are chewable vitamins. My parents have a lot of rules. So you mean you, like, run the joint? Bran asks the man behind the counter. 
I own this bakery, yes. Eduardo offers an impatient-looking smile. I get the sense this isn't the first time he has explained this. So then why not just call the place Eduardo's? Topher asks. Sometimes I think my curiosity rubs off on him. The large man behind the counter sighs. His mustache actually curves up at the ends. I'm tempted to reach over and tug on it to see if it's real or if it's like the cardboard cakes in the window. But I don't, because people don't like it when you pull on their facial hair. I know this from experience. Let me ask you something, Eduardo begins, draping both large hands over the cash register in front of him. And be honest. Would you rather buy a big, fancy, expensive cake from a place card called Eduardo's or from a place called Michelle's? I don't actually see where it makes any difference, so long as the big, fancy cake tastes good. So I just shrug. Maybe it's a trick question. Ms. Bix Bixby would ask trick questions sometimes, just to make sure we were paying attention. My favorite was, before Mount Everest was discovered, what was the highest mountain in the world? Everyone in class got it wrong but me. Eduardo doesn't wait for an answer. Would you go to a Mexican restaurant named Michelle's? He prods. I don't eat Mexican food. The, boots, the beans make me f I start to say, but Topher elbows me in the side so I don't finish the sentence. It doesn't matter. Eduardo knows. Me too, he says, patting his stomach. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's what beans do. What people do. The natural order of things. It's to be expected. We are creatures of habit. Most people, they prefer to buy their cakes from a place called Michelle's. That's just how it is. I look at the sign for Michelle's in the window and try to imagine it saying Eduardo's instead. Maybe he's right. I know exactly what Ms. Bixby would say if she were here, though. She'd say, when, you're in, when you are content by simply being yourself, everyone will respect you. It's something she borrowed from L Lao, no, Lao Tzu. Hey, I'm sorry, I have no idea how to say that. L-A-O-T-Z-U. Two words. Uh, I know because I looked it up too. L Lao Tzu wasn't so wise though. He was also the one who said that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Not bothering to mention the five million more steps you have to take after that. I've done the math. I look back at Eduardo and consider telling him about Lao Tzu and suggest he change the name of his bakery. But I'm guessing he probably wouldn't take the advice of a 12-year-old Japanese kid named Steve. So what can I do for you gentlemen? Eduardo asks. Behind us, Brand has wandered off already, looking at the enclosed glass cases, heading to the refrigerators on the other side. I fill in the gap he leaves behind, shuffling closer to Topher. We are looking for a cake, Topher says, raising one eyebrow and using one of his make-believe voices. He's done this as long as I've known him. I guess he's pretending we are police detectives or something. Police detectives who hunt down suspicious desserts. White chocolate raspberry supreme cheesecake. Maybe you've heard of it? Eduardo, who owns Michelle's, nods appreciatively, Strong, stroking his mustache, saying along, playing along, Yes, I know the cake you speak of, he says. So you know how we can get it? Topher nudges. That depends, Eduardo says. Do you want it whole or by the slice? Topher looks to me. Probably he senses a story problem coming on, and I'm the math genius among us. How much, I ask thinking of the original plan, which was to get a whole cake and split it among the four of us, but then thinking about how much money we have between us. Without even batting an eyelash, the man behind the counter says, $7.99 for the slice, $54.90 for the whole enchilada. The word enchilada strikes me as funny for some reason, and I almost laugh, but Topher is not at all amused. You can tell by the way his eyebrows jump into his bangs. $55? <laughs> That baker with the curly mustache shrugs. At Eduardo's, you could probably get it for 40 But this is Michelle's, so it's 55 He gives us a wry smile. And I count two silver teeth. Tover, Topher looks physically pained. I thought you said it would be three bucks, he whispers at me. 
I said I had it had three dollar signs in front of the review online. That means it's expensive, I explained. Behind us, Brand is still standing at the freezer, staring at his reflection in the frosted glass. Topher throws his hands up. Forget it, he says. No way. No cake is worth fifty bucks. I nod in agreement. It does seem like a lot for creamy cheese and sugar. Eduardo leans over the counter and clears his throat. His cheeks are pocked. I can see now that his mostly coal-colored hair is shifting to gray by his ears. He beckons us closer with one finger. And Topher and I lean in. Excuse me, mijo, but have you ever tried Michelle's white chocolate raspberry supreme cheesecake? He's speaking to both of us, but it seems as if he's looking right at me. His eyes are spooky. They're brown, but so dark that it looks like he just has two giant pupils. I shake my head. Crescent Dios? Uh, Eduardo asks. I don't speak Spanish, Topher says. I can only count to 20, I say, though I'm pretty fluent in Japanese, and I know a few Russian curses that Topher and I learned in, uh, off the internet. But I'm guessing Eduardo is not going to call me a... And I'm not going to say it because it might be a swear word. I don't know. Blank, blank. Uh, are you a religious person, Eduardo translates? I'm not sure what that has to do with anything. But Topher is looking at me like I'm supposed to answer. His parents are atheists. I take communi communion, at least, so I nod. And have you ever been to heaven? Obviously, another trick question. But I don't have a trick answer, so I don't even bother. Eduardo points his finger at us in triumph. That's because you never tried my white chocolate raspberry supreme cheesecake. Then he slaps his hands on the counter with a tremendous thump, and my knees knock instinctively. Trust me, amigos, eight dollars a slice is a bargain. Heaven should be so cheap. Fine, Topher groans. We'll take two slices. I'm not sure what kind of math he's doing. I'm guessing he thinks we will just split each of them in half, Though, if it comes to sharing with Brand or even Ms. Bixby, I will probably pass. I'm not comfortable with sharing my food with just anyone. Topher asks me for money, and I fish for the ten that I brought. He digs in the front pockets of his backpack and pulls out a paper clip holding a ten and two fives. He adds the fives to mine and slaps the cash on the counter. He keeps, he keeps the other ten in reserve. Two slices, he repeats. Eduardo is about to take the money when Brand's voice stops him. We're getting the whole cake. I turn to see him standing right behind us. He has his wallet out. I didn't know he owned a wallet. I don't own a wallet. I don't even have a paper clip. Brand produces a 20 and lays it on the counter, making it $40. I'm not sure about his math skills either. Dude, what are you doing? Topher hisses. It has to be the whole cake, Brand says. No compromises. Eduardo eyes the bill suspiciously with his brown button eyes. The whole cake is fifty-four ninety. He reminds us. Topher starts to say something, but Brand puts a hand on Topher's shoulder. Why don't you two wait for me outside, he says. Topher hesitates, but I head for the door. I'm used to following directions. My father said the same thing not too long ago. Told me to wait outside. And I would have, because I am in the habit of doing whatever either parent of my parents asks of me. Maybe I should have. But then I would have missed the look on his face when Miss when Bixby finally called him out. It was a parent-teacher conference. But it wasn't the regularly scheduled parent-teacher conference that only comes once a year. This was an impromptu meeting, arranged by my father almost immediately after seeing my last report card. Most notably, the B in language arts. Not a B plus, which is disappointing, but can be tolerated due to its close proximity to something better, but a p pathetically ordinary B, like a boil, <laughs> ugly and bumpy and sticking out amid the array of A's, impossible to ignore. I was afraid to bring the report card home. The B was an abnormality. I knew, and it called for an explanation. I offered the best one I could, 
which was that I struggled with some of the reading quizzes and writing assignments. My mother nodded and told me I would do better next time, but my father wasn't satisfied, which was how I found myself standing outside room 213 with my father the next evening after dinner. My mother at gymnastics with Christina, whose report card was blemish free and already magneted to the refrigerator. Miss Bixby appeared in the doorway, looking cheerful despite having been struck, <laughs> having been stuck at school so long. She asked us to asked us to come in. I started to go, but my father grabbed my shoulder, holding me back. Wait out here, he said, pointing to the chairs teachers keep in the hall for students who need time to reflect on their choices. Like when Trevor Cowley blew his nose in his hand and then wiped on the back of my shirt. Ew. I started to head toward the chair when Ms. Bixby interrupted. It's all right, Mr. Sakata, she said evenly. Stephen is welcome to join us. My father looked at Ms. Bixby and then the empty chair and then me. Finally, he bowed his head and Ms. Bixby ushered us both inside. I noticed him staring at her. He did the same thing back at back to school night. Ms. Bixby reached up and touched the strand of pink self-consciously. You think that's something? You should see my tattoo. That's what Ms. Bixby usually said when someone, usually a student, commented on her hair. Of course, she confided in us that she didn't really have a tattoo. It was just something clever to say. Ms. Bixby didn't use the imaginary tattoo line on my father, however. She just touched her hair and asked us both to sit down. He retrieved the report card from the inside pocket of his suit and set it on the desk between them, then immediately launched into a prepared speech on the topic of the recent decline in Stephen's evaluated performance, complete with a painstakingly accurate account of my elementary career thus far, which had been B-less, though dented with a few near-miss A-minuses. Somewhere in the speech, I heard the words surprising, error, and inexcusable. Ms. Bixby listened patiently, waiting for a breath, keeping her eyes on my father, who concluded by asking her how it was possible for his son to have been given such a grade. Your son earned a B, Ms. Bixby says. I didn't give it to him. He did very well on all of his spelling tests, and his reading comprehension has improved steadily from the beginning of the year. He's an excellent student. Exactly. Excellent, my father said, repeating the part that interested him. Excellent is A work. B's at Fox Ridge Elementary signify above average work, Ms. Bixby clarified. It is below his average, my father retorted, the corners of his mouth tightening. His studies, he studies two hours a day after school. He takes Japanese. He reads every night before bed. His mother and I quiz him about what he's read. It seems impossible for him to get anything less than an A. It sounds like you keep him very busy, Ms. Bixby replied, though it didn't sound like a compliment. Then she pulled up a screen on her laptop. It looks like Stephen struggled a little through our fiction unit this year and missed some questions on his reading quizzes. That's all. It's only a third quarter grade. There are plenty of opportunities left in the year to improve, though I think he should be happy with what he's accomplished so far. She turned and smiled at me. I smiled back, then quickly readopted the look of self-disappointment that I came in with before my father noticed. I'm sure my son is only satisfied with doing his very best, my father answered. I'm sure he is too, Ms. Bixby said. But a B is a perfectly acceptable grade. Already, it had gone from above average to perfectly acceptable. My father had that effect on people. He would soon have con her convinced that a B was a stain on my record that should be removed before it ruined my chances of ever getting into a decent college. Perhaps for other students in your class, he responded coldly, but not for Stephen. Ms. Bixby's cheeks turned pink to match her shock her shock of hair. Suddenly, the two of them started talking over each other. Mr. Sakata, I appreciate what you were trying to say, 
But I think what's more important is that Stephen feels like he is being challenged and that he is growing socially and intellectually, making connections and... But in my son's case, it represents a breakdown in the learning process, either on his end or on yours, and signifies grades are just one way to reflect and measure that growth and that one. His sister certainly never earned a B in her life, and both of his parents are quite well educated. Spend too much time focusing on end results, not enough time on the process. The journey is your son that your son is taking. Feel that the real problem is that you aren't challenging him enough, or maybe your system of evaluation is flawed and needs... I simply don't think one little bee is really worth worrying about. My father cleared his throat. My son is a straight A student, Ms. Bixby, he said, straightening himself up, his voice rising to match. I looked to see Ms. Bixby smiling. Is that what your bumper sticker says? I laughed. I couldn't help it. I might have only smiled if it wasn't for the fact that there actually is a proud parent of straight A students sticker pasted on the back of the Volvo. I'm not sure how she knew, or even if she knew. Maybe it was a lucky guess. Or maybe she had this kind of this same kind of discussion before with someone else's father, bickering over someone else's B. Excuse me, my father barked. Ms. Bixby blushed again. I'm sorry, that was uncalled for. You're absolutely right. You should be proud of Stephen. Incredibly, incredibly proud. He's one of the brightest students I've ever had the honor to teach. He surprises me every day with how much he knows, and his curiosity is insatiable. I will make sure that he and I work hard on the next several weeks to ensure that all his grades are reflecting all of his grades reflect the kind of student that he is. She gave a polite smile. My father stared at her hair again. That's all I'm asking, he said gruffly, reaching out and retrieving my report card, holding it with two fingers like a used tissue. Thank you for your time. He rose, and Miss Bixby rose too. They shook hands politely. I wasn't at all sure who the victor was. I was still laughing inside at the bumper sticker remark. Then, as we were walking out the door to room 213, Ms. Bixby called my name. I turned and she stretched out her finger, her look asking me to do the same. Our fingers touched lightly at the tips and her eyes brightened. Be good, she said. It was a line from E.T., I know because Topher and I had seen the movie four times already. But I also knew she was making a joke. Thankfully, my father didn't get it. Or maybe he just didn't hear. Then she said, see you tomorrow, and thanks for coming. And I couldn't be sure, but I think she closed the door to her classroom with a little more force than usual. Back in the Volvo, my father shook his head. Never have these problems with your sister. Her teachers understand. I think Ms. Bixby understands, I said. Doesn't matter, my father grumbled. Only eight more weeks, meaning only eight more weeks in the semester. Eight more weeks to bring my grade up. Eight more weeks with Ms. Bixby. Eight more weeks to deal with this woman with the crazy hair who obviously didn't know how to teach, or at least didn't appreciate the cicada greatness when she saw it. Eight weeks. Except his math was wrong. He didn't know what was growing inside her. None of us did. There were really only four. The bells on the door ch chirp at us on our way out, leaving Brand and Eduardo huddled over the counter. Topher and I sit on the curb next to each other, knees almost touching. Topher reaches down and plucks a pebble from the street, rolling it back and forth between his fingers. I take my phone out and type in, why is cheesecake so expensive? The, the answer, according to the first website I check, is because it is yummy. That hardly seems scientific. The real answer, I suspect, is that people are willing to pay that much for it. What if it were, to, what if it were Topher's? I put the phone down and look at Topher. He's looking at the pebble, smooth and gray, barely the size of an M&M. 
It's just a rock, I tell him. You can probably have it if you want. I'm not sure why he's talking about himself in the third person. Not the rock, the bakery, he says, looking up at the sign. What if it were called Topher's? How much do you think I could charge for that cheesecake? Now I understand. It's a game. How much is your name worth? Would it be called Topher's or Christopher's, I ask back. Not that it would make a difference to me. I'd shop there regardless, even though I know for a fact Topher doesn't know how to bake. The one time we tried to make cookies at his house, we set off the smoke detector. I don't know. I guess Christopher's sounds better. Topher's is more of the name of an ice cream parlor, don't you think? I don't actually think about things like this. That's why I have Topher around. I guess so, I say. What about Steve's? Topher scrunches his nose. Sorry, man. I'm not sure you could charge more than 20 bucks. Nobody wants to buy cheesecake from Steve. No offense. I'm not offended. It takes a lot more than that, especially coming from him. But I'd really... I'm sorry. <laughs> I'd totally buy comic books from one, he adds. Then his smile... Then he smiles, his dimples surfacing. He has a great smile. I try to imagine what my parents would say if I told them I was going to skip college and open up my own comic book store. I picture their heads exploding. The thought makes me smile, too. What's he doing in there anyway, Topher says, craning his neck. Brand's back is to us. Eduardo is nodding over and over. I shrug. I can tell it bothers Topher, being kicked out, sitting out here on the curb while Brand is in there, carrying on the mission, or whatever he's doing. But it doesn't bother me. I think about all the times the two of us have sat together like this, on the bus, on the floor in his basement, in the cardboard fort we built we built in his backyard, always side by side, never across from each other. Topher flicks the pebble with his thumb. I watch it skitter across the parking lot and bounce into a drain. I could never make that shot on my first try, or the second. You think this is a good idea, he asks. It's a lot of money for a cake, I say. I don't mean the cake. Not just the cake, anyway. I mean all of it. He stretches his hand out to indicate all of it, his shoulder bumping into mine. I mean, do you think it's weird? Do you think she'll think it's weird? The word weird just sits there between us. I think about Ms. Bixby, who made us all memorize monologues from our favorite movies instead of famous speeches from history. Well, I still memorized the Gettysburg Address because my parents insisted on it, claiming that it was also technically from a movie and had greater educational value. Ms. Bixby, who once came to school wearing her bathrobe over her normal clothes because it was 20 degrees outside and she couldn't find her coat. Ms. Bixby, who kept books scattered all around the room in the most unusual places, tucked in with a hand sanitizer, sitting on the windowsills, stacked up on top of the python's terrarium, because, as she put it, stories are everywhere, just waiting to be found. I think she's a little weird, I say. She probably thinks you're a little weird, Topher says. I think you're a little weird. Don't worry, it's a good thing. It just means you're remarkable. I think you're weird too, I say. Come to think of it, Topher continues, I think the word weird is kind of weird. Just say it out loud a few times. Weird, weird, weird. I start to chant it along with him. The two of us sitting on the curb saying weird over and over again. I suppose if you say anything over and over again, it starts to sound strange. I have to agree with that. About 12 weirds in, the door behind us jangles again, and Brand comes out of the bakery, carrying a square white box, holding it with both hands. The box doesn't have one of those see-through windows that bakery cakes from the grocery store always have, but I can only guess it's the whole enchilada. What was all that about? Topher asks. I can tell he's miffed, and he's letting Brand know. No big deal, Brand says. I took care of it. You took care of it? Topher repeats. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> what, are you the godfather now? How much did he charge you? Did you actually get it for 40? Rand shakes his head and smiles. He hands the box to Topher, who nearly drops it, grunting with the weight. 
Then he hands me back my crumpled ten and one of Topher's fives. Somehow he got the cake for less than half the price. Turns out it's teacher appreciation day, he says with a shrug. Through the windows of Michelle's, I see the baker shrug at us too. Welcome to Edu Eduardo's, Bran says. All right, that's the end of that one. I know these chapters are running a bit long, but that's just the way it's written. Um, here in my area, we are coming into a four-day weekend, and we just came off a of winter break, but that's cool, I guess. So if you have a four-day weekend, I hope you make the best of it. And even if you have a regular weekend, I hope you have a wonderful one. Let me know if you have anything fun and exciting going on. Uh, when the next part is ready, you'll find it right in this area. Click my picture up there to subscribe, like, comment, share. Do whatever you want to do. I'm, I'm game. <laughs> Until next time, keep reading.